share our hearts and see what God's doing. So in that same um, foundation, we will move to date of learning, not just from a intellectual standpoint. You want a Kiwi? But from, huh? uh, not just an observational one, but one that we could uh, put into practice. What does it mean? So that's where we'll go and focus on today is more of, we, we looked at some of the, uh, the furniture, the pieces in the outer court, in the Holy of Holies. Uh, but what does that mean for my life today? I can understand how that, why it was done then as a foreshadowing of the sacrifice. Okay. But what, it's kind of, it's, it's cool to see how we can piece the puzzle together to recognize why God did that as a foreshadowing of his sacrifice. But what implications does that have for me today in my living room, outside of my house, as I'm going through life? So we'll kind of spend some time, and we're not even going to hit all of them. I think we're going to, we, we really haven't spent time in the Holy of Holies. I think we're going to take that as its own chunk. Uh, I'm thinking next week is, well, well, depending on what happens next week, <laughs> where we're at, but our next time together, we'll look at the Holy of Holies, the implications of it being Christ. Uh, how he is the fulfillment of a lot of that. And then also, what does it look like for me? Yeah, what are the implications for me? So we'll be reading through a lot of scripture today. So hopefully you have your Bible handy. I don't, so I got to go get mine. I'll be right back. Let's see some more chicken pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Those were funny, weren't they? <laughs> hey, Dan, I got a question. Hey, yep. <clears throat> Kind of um, geared to what you were just saying about the thing, like the uh, idea of the crushing of the uh, olives, the ol to you know produce that olive oil. Yeah. In the example of like uh, Peter, and then uh, and then you, I think you went to Job. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking, they did that every day, right? Yeah. So I'm so I'm thinking I'm not sure, but I think we're going through that process every day of that crushing and, and uh, I'm thinking, so that would, that would be like in different degrees, you think, or I, I'd imagine because your life is up and down and stuff, so. But in yeah. a sense, you know, the Peter experiences like that doesn't happen every day or the Job, but probably once or twice maybe in your life, that big crushing, but every day, no, anyway, yeah, yeah, if you could answer yeah. that. Sure. No, I think that is, it goes along with that idea of Romans 12, that I live as a living sacrifice, which involves, if there's a sacrifice being made in my life, yeah. if I am the temple, then all the things happening in the temple, that's kind of the personal implications where we're going. Yeah, it's a, um, I'm forever burning as a lampstand, and in order for me to be forever burning with Christ, there's that crushing there's the oil there. So yeah, absolutely. I think that's a good observation that it's not just a once I'm, I'm crushed once so that I could forever be burning. It is this daily process where less of me, more of him, uh, which is a crushing. <clears throat> but the beauty is that ultimately it is because of Christ's crushing that we have access to these things. And so the crushing we experience is a um, is one that is in some ways even self-inflicted uh but there are outside things that attack there is the enemy there is uh baggage that we carry but christ's crushing is the catalyst for me to be able to be adopted into a life of transformation which will involve lesser crushings i don't mean lesser that it's not going to be painful but it's not to the degree that christ was crushed so if you recall Philippians 3.10, that was kind of our theme verse last session, not the one we months ago. I want to know the power of his, res his resurrection. Uh, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And I don't want to inaccurately quote it. Let's see. <clears throat> Three ten. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his suffering by becoming like him in death. Like, again, that's, it's not <laughs> flowery words. That is the 
picture of um, sharing and suffering, becoming yeah. like him in death. And so we are adopted into a lifestyle that is constantly um, understanding his suffering, which may involve me suffering, involve in his death, which does require self denial, death to self, picking up my cross and following him daily. So uh, yeah, absolutely. There is, we, we do better if we understand that this is a daily surrendering, a daily sacrifice, a daily crushing. What, what other observations have come to mind over the, the week? Well, I was just listening to you share about your situation with meeting with somebody. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. And um, I'm just so encouraged that you shared that. And so thank you because recently I had a situation and it was uh, within the church and I wanted to handle it biblically. And I don't think I really did because I had all that self stuff going on. You know what I mean? And I don't do confrontation because I, I just don't. And so I think that you're sharing that kind of gave me hope that I can get that and at one point be able to strongly, even though it's a really difficult situation, you know, we have to deal with one another. We're a family. And um, I think that that's what's, what's hard for me. And I've been going through lately is not being able to, to stand up and for what's right, if that makes sense. <laughs> sure. <clears throat> no, that's, it is, it's a hard, hard process. Um, and anytime we, Christine and I have learned when we are in, going to encounter anything in life uh, that is gonna involve conversations with another person who is another soul who embodies the personhood of Christ, we, we genuinely, genuinely want to approach that in reverence, not just for God, but for the other person who is also a temple. And <clears throat> it, requires a, it requires a preparation. And so even when we talk about the ways that the priests would prepare themselves, wash themselves, the offering before that was made before the sins of the people, there was an offering made for himself. And all that, again, just what a, what a great transition this what we're talking about this morning for me to be the temple and for me to exercise and be the parts of the temple of the tabernacle, uh, even for me to come and offer something, sometimes there needs to be an emptying offering <laughs> before that. And so when we do um, engage in conversations that are going to be difficult, we do often spend time in prayer, emptying time of just asking the Lord for us not to show up for him to. And that is a journey process that is, it takes practice. I think it does take a lot of practice and humility that is not uh, humanly possible. <laughs> and that's why it is, we, we say, no me, yes you, <laughs> yes Lord. And so, yeah, that there is definitely hope in moving towards that. Uh, and that's, that's, that's the goal as well, is that we could honor him and other, honor others as temple, <laughs> uh, because that's the reality as well. And that's hard. And emotions can run high in us. And how do I not let my emotions dictate where I go, what I say, what I do, how I respond, how I react. And that is, um, what comes to mind is the, even when Christ, when, G, when the, he sent the disciples out and they're going out to cast demons, right? Going out to heal. And they approach and they're like, we couldn't do it. We prayed and, and it was like nothing happened. And Christ says that that only happens through prayer and fasting. So from a logistical perspective, you would think, okay, well, before I do that, I got to pray and fast. And well, I don't have time to pray and fast. I, he's not talking about an event. He's talking about a lifestyle. In order to get to the point where you can ex understand that degree of his presence, it requires an emptying process prior to that point. And we need to live in a, a lifestyle where we are fasting is that idea of forsaking myself and what I think I need for the benefit of receiving Christ. And prayer is emptying myself 
so that I can have constant communication and not just communication to hear him, but to allow him to be the one speaking through me. That is the type of presence and power that's necessary for certain obstacles and for certain things. And so that's where if, if we aren't committed to a process of emptying, when we do face the hard things, often we're going to either fail or it's going to be a, it's just going to be a learning process. And that learning process is not going to end. There's going to be a constant need to empty self. But the more we could do that in preparation and beforehand, I think we're going to see greater even joy in the sorrow. But yeah, so hopefully that is. That's a hope-filled uh, perspective that God is a, he's awesome in the way he works. And we, we need to step aside and let him. It's just hard to step aside because because we're human, because <laughs> we're flawed. Yeah. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. That is our theme. What a beautiful goal. What a, what a great um, want. But do we want to accept the latter part of that, of sharing of his sufferings <laughs> by becoming like him in death? Hmm, no. But yes. So when we see outer court, we spoke about a few of the details in there, the idea of the linen work, the fine linen work that was all throughout, even to the outer parts of the court, uh, the, the gate that was entering. We haven't spoken of the gate much, but there's the gate entering just even into the courtyard, into the outer courts. Uh, there is a certain entrance there as well. And then you had the, uh, the brazen altar, or the bronze altar, and then you also had the brazen and the bronze um, wash basin. And those are the primary elements. There were certain tables that were out for the, the killing of the sacrifice, but there are, there's me entering through from this great perspective. And it's important for, uh, oops. Okay, guys. It's important for us to be able to see those parts and what is one show to enter into those okay. um, the gate for instance where do we see Christ as gate anything you recall <laughs> where do we see Jesus as the gate there are times he speaks about it as t in terms of the sheep pen the the shepherd and that I am the gate and you can only enter through the gate. Others will try to approach from a different way. Those are thieves, robbers, but he is the gate. And so even allowing, even seeing pictures of him being the only entrance point into the tabernacle, which we know is Christ, he, there's only one way to God. It's through Christ. It's through that gate. Likewise, that tabernacle is, it's, there's only one way in. And then we see, we would see a, large altar that we spoke of the last couple of weeks. So we would see that and recognize there's a lot of death that happens on there. There's a, it's probably a nasty, smelly, bloody thing that wasn't, uh, there's, I may have to go back, but I don't recall there ever being anything of washing that thing down. <laughs> uh, there, there's no instructions as to how to get rid of the death. So that thing was nasty and messy. Uh, so as you're entering in, I don't know what the fly situation was in the wilderness, but <laughs> that, it just, that was probably not just, yeah. And it wasn't entering into this picture where like, wow, look at how beautiful and bronze this thing is. I don't know what that was. How much of the blood splatter was just there? And it's a, it's a bloody mess. And uh, yeah, so we, we understand this picture of the altar being a place where sacrifices were, were offered up or actually where the, the killing was, where the, bur where the burning was taking place of the flesh of the animals. And probably some barbecue smells that might have been fragrance, but mixed with a whole lot of other things. And, um, 
it was the meat that they would eat, that the commun there's a communal thing that they would eat. Uh, so there are, there are full, a few offerings that were mentioned and uh, I'll mention a few of them and just kind of give you a brief picture of what the purposes were that were made on this offering table. You had the burnt offering uh, and that was a, a certain animal that was spec specified as to what animal it would be blemished or unblemished in this way. Uh, usually it was a goat or a calf or a lamb or uh, even a dove uh, and different sacrifices required or allowed for different animals and different types. We won't go through all those. You can read those, those through Leviticus. Uh, but the burnt offering was atonement for unintentional sin and it was also an act of worship. Uh, you had grain offering, which wasn't the killing of anything, but it was the offering of different spices and incenses. And those are the ones that were even brought into the holy place for the altar of incense to be offered. There were fe fellowship offerings or peace offerings, which was also a act of worship and thanksgiving. That was the killing of an animal. Uh, but it was also a communal offering and they would eat the meat as a body. They, were, they would share in that offering uh, as a group. Sin offering, this was the mandatory offering that was made for atonement for sin. And then there were the guilt offerings as well, which is a mandatory offering that was made for atonement of sin. So it was interesting to see these different types of offering. And some were made by anybody who can come into the outer courts and offer up something. But then there were the, the special offerings where only the high priest can come in and make certain atonement and offerings. Uh, certain priests, not the high priest, but the priests were able to go into the Holy of Holy and do the incense burning uh, and other offerings. So there's degrees of what was allowed and what people did, and there were um, de differences in what these offerings would be. And I bring that up because I think it's important to recognize that we can't we don't want to just say, well, Jesus was that final sacrifice, the offering, he had the atonement for sin. Therefore, why do I have to do anything? I can just sit back and enjoy his offering because he is the final sacrifice. Yeah, absolutely. But that does not mean there aren't other offerings to still be made. And the other offerings is myself as a living sacrifice. Uh, so the offering made by Christ on the altar covers my sin completely. It is the atonement. But for instance, this, the idea of grain offering or fellowship peace offering, those were for the purpose of Thanksgiving. Those were for the purpose of communal gatherings. And so there's still offerings that we are, it's not that we have to make, it's that we are allowed to come and make. It's that we are still given access into the life of Christ and the death of Christ and able to offer things to him, to one another, uh, and even to offer uh, to ourselves that help us engage in God living, in Christ living. Uh, so it's a privilege and an honor to be able to come in and offer grain offerings or uh, to offer peace offerings, to offer, uh, we, we don't have the ability to do the sin offering. And that's where, thank God, he did that for us. But these offerings, even the burnt offering, um, there, are certain, there are us. There is that idea of us being laid on the altar to be able to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, which we see Paul use in Romans 12, 1 and 2. So we understand that, that we don't want to sit idly by and say, thank you, Lord, for offering. I can just sit back and wait to get to heaven at some point. It's what we've talked about before of just uh, the inaccurate perception of me being able just to say, um, or me even just to resign myself to, I just got to endure until I, I'm dead. <laughs> I just got to endure until Christ comes back. That is not resurrection life. That is not the life we're called into. It is so much more beautiful and mysterious than that. And that's, that's why we talk about it. It's an important thing, I think, for the body to understand, uh, to move in that direction, in that, into that truth. Any thoughts so far? Yeah, I was thinking more like how we, uh, you know, I think in, in, in our thinking, Mary, Mama, myself, we, you know, we believe in the tithing, but I, you know, but we go, we've gone through a season where we understand that there's 
above and beyond just the tithing, this it's that offering too. And uh, I'm not even sure if even if your ten percent is a, a mandatory, but I I think it you know from your heart, yeah, it is. You know. Um, yep. That would be a, a, a peace offering, you think? Yeah, I think that's the peace offering or even that grain offering. It's an act of worship, oh, okay. recognition of God's goodness. That was kind of the purpose of the grain offering. Uh, it is, that, as we know, they offered a tenth of their grain, their spices. They would do all these things, um, even in the time of Jesus. And they were so, it was very legalistic about how they were going to do this. And they, they missed it because it wasn't about giving the ten. It was about recognizing that I'm going to go without. Uh, I'm going to even potentially suffer because I feel I need this grain or I need this extra money. I need that whatever it is that we're offering up. Uh, I believe that that's, it's really a sacrifice. And if it really isn't a sacrifice for me to do it, if I'm giving from my abundance, okay. I mean, that can help do whatever it's, it's going to help pay staff or do something. But the point of tithes and offering isn't for other people's benefits. It is for me to learn submission and surrender and doing with it. And so, yeah, whether that's 10%, 5%, 2%, 100%, I mean, I don't know if we get there, but it is more about me offering and me submission, my submission and sacrifice than it is about what God's going to do with my offering. Because in reality, many of the offerings that were given in the, in the tabernacle, they're just burnt. <laughs> These spices, they're put on the altar and it was like, okay, they're a sweet aroma. And I was like, well, we could have gotten money for those. We could have done... It wasn't for the, the uh, monetary, the, any financial, anything. It was, it was the people being able to let go of something in honor of God. And likewise, I think that's really the essence of that tithing. Letting go of something special to me because I want to demonstrate that I trust. Yeah. Um, I know for me that being of service is an incredibly important part of who I am in Christ. And it's been really hard with COVID not being able to be serving, it, you know, so I've had to be kind of like imaginative and find other ways of doing things. But um, I just find that my soul is so filled when I'm doing things for others because it gets me out of me. And that's about the only time I'm out of me is when I'm doing something for someone else. Yeah, that's good. That's a great illustration of the way that when we do offer, that's, that's part of their goal. That's what it does. When we offer ourselves, it, it's a, a way, a tangible way to demonstrate that I'm letting go of me. And then that focus does, is able to shift to where it could be. Yeah, that's good. In any offerings that we're doing. And I do believe that tithing is necessary even today. There's not much in New Testament about what is that look like. Uh, I, I think similarly to what Christ, I think if we look at it from the perspective that we've been studying through, we, the claim could be made that we are supposed to offer everything, that all of it is his. And so if, and we need to be sensitive to recognize what is he calling me to do with what I have. And so this month, it could be God is saying, I need you to give all of your paycheck or this to whatever he's saying. And we could argue, well, that's more than 10%. It, it, it's not about the percentage. It is what does God put it on your heart uh, and what is necessary for you to let go of you. And so that is an important part uh, of what offering is, time, services, money, um, fasting. I'm going to let go of this amount of food for a season because I need my body to be under submission and COVID has been a time where our bodies have been fed. <laughs> it's, a, it's a time where we are growing. Uh, Generously. <laughs> so that idea of fasting is putting my physical body, my outer courts into submission. It's not just about me feeding the holy of holies and being what is the inner core. It is also putting under subjection all things of who I am, body, soul, spirit, mind, all, everything. The disciplines we mentioned uh, a while ago in a study were uh, solitude, practicing solitude, fasting, uh, all these things are tools of learning how to let go of me. And it's 
tangible, again, tangible ways for us to demonstrate how I'm going to uh, deny myself for the sake of trusting God. And those are healthy practices to do. Good. We talked about the garden, how holy place was a garden picture, how much of the tabernacle was pictured after the garden. Uh, I know we talked about it Wednesday briefly, but I, wanted, I thought it, it was important to circle back around this idea of we were created for the garden. We were intended to eternally be in garden life, uh, in tabernacle life. Again, the tabernacle is more of a picture of the garden. It's instead of the garden being a foreshadowing of the tabernacle, the garden wasn't a foreshadow of anything. The garden was the place of existence with God, with his presence. So that wasn't intended to end. It was through sin that that stopped. But garden life, garden living was not a temporary thing. That was intended to be eternal forever. Uh, so because of sin, there's a separation. The tabernacle was that picture of of hope, uh, of garden living happening once again, and foreshadowing then of Christ being who? Also being gardener, and Adam being gardener. God created these things. He planted, he did, took care of, and then he gave care of man to take care of these things uh, over the animals, over the plants. And there's this really cool, interesting idea of God and us partnering as gardener. Uh, and, and so even looking into this, interesting that if you recall, after the resurrection of Christ, remember, no words are used in scripture that are just there for whatever, for no reason. But yet Mary approaches and asks the gentleman, where have you laid my master? And it says, supposing he was the gardener. And there's that language of Mary seeing Christ as gardener. I think in our culture, we see gardener as the people who come and mow our lawn, <laughs> right? I mean, we have a different perspective of gardener. We think of like lowly, oh, he's just the maintenance man. Where if we, look, if we were to do, that's its own study probably, but do a study of what does gardener mean, the person of the, the garden uh, in scripture, we see a different picture. We see one of kingship, actually. We see when we talk about the gardens uh, of David and the gardens of the kings, usually gardens were, were spoken along, uh, alongside kingship. And this idea uh, that they have of gardener was not the ones who just watered the plants, mowed the lawn. It was the one who took care of the fields, who took care of the fruit that was coming from the land. It was actually a very prestigious thing that most people just didn't have. It was the owner's kingship, uh, the, guard, the palace gardens. So it was just an interesting connection because I always saw Mary's misunderstanding of gardener to think he must have just looked like raggedy and like his tools, his tool belt working. No, it, it was more of a kingship thing of here's the owner of this land and what have you done with my savior? What have you done with Jesus? And it's like, wow, that was an interesting picture that even that language is a reminder that John chooses to use and put in his gospel of recollecting what Mary had said, the importance of recognizing Jesus as the garden gardener in that. <laughs> and this back to the garden picture, garden scene, gardens. So that's a kind of a cool idea and it would take more investigation to see just how much in the New Testament, Old Testament, that idea of gardener and it pointing to Christ as well, pointing to who he is uh, the one cultivating, the one pruning, the one doing, the one uh, uh, being the, the branch, the vine who is being watered. And it, it's like it all points to him, though. He's the gardener. He's the vine. He's the, we're the branches. But all these ideas are like, it's him. It's him. It's him. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Uh, the garden. Well, that even that, it's, it's a presence of God. And uh, so we, brief, we touched on on Wednesday the idea of garden life being the goal. And day one of creation, day two, day three, day six, and then day seven was that rest. Remember, there's Sabbath. There is the seventh day. And the intention was not that six days happen, seven day of rest, and then here comes, here comes the next day again where God's going to start working. 
that's not the intention of the garden picture. It was work, work, work. There was Sabbath forever. There was eternal Sabbath after the work of God is finished. And that was the intention of the garden scene, that there was work to create. It is all good. It's good, man. It's very good. Then we live in this place of rest. We talked about promised land. The promised land being the picture of being still. Remember, we talked about that being able to calm ourselves to be still. Uh, that was the intention. That was the eternal goal was to live in the rest and peace with Christ and in Christ. So the garden scene was, was God walking in the coolness of the day with and looking for Adam, walking and talking with Adam and Eve, being able to journey together. The presence was, there was no separation. So Sabbath was intended to be that place we live. And that in speaking of it, I think it speaks light into the severity of breaking Sabbath. Uh, that's, and that's the part we talked about Wednesday, where understanding Sabbath and recognizing why is that thou shalt not murder, thou shalt keep the Sabbath. It seems like gr growing up, there was always a big disconnect, for me at least, in my like, understanding of not resting one day doesn't seem as severe as murdering someone, as adultery, as putting gods before other gods before God. And yet, minus the hope of another Sabbath, minus the hope that we will one day again live in the rest, which is Christ, which is going to come by way of his sacrifice, I can understand more now the severity of not forgetting the Sabbath. So for, by forsaking Sabbath rest means I'm forsaking presence with him for all eternity. I'm forsaking the promise that we will once again have garden life. And so it's not about resting for a day. It's about having hope that once again, we will experience not work, but the enjoyment of presence uh, with our God for all eternity. That's the, I, I believe, the true meaning of what Sabbath is intended to be. So we see Christ healing on the Sabbath. That's a true fulfillment of his rest because now he is in the business of making people whole. So those who are healed, the blind man, the crippled, who are being healed on Sabbath, that's the truest picture of Sabbath, where they are finally able to experience wholeness and rest in the presence of Christ. And so for the Pharisees to say, how is he healing on the Sabbath? What an abomination. He's saying, you guys aren't getting it. This is the true Sabbath rest, is being made whole for all eternity. And it's easier for me to say, get up, um, or what is it, the, the phrase of being able to, to say, get up, your sins are forgiven, or get up and walk. There, but it, it was a both and. Sometimes he used physical healing as a means to show that true Sabbath is coming and that it's here. So really to deny Sabbath rest and for the Israelites to be, um, to suffer the consequences of not observing Sabbath rest means they were forsaking the future hope as well of Christ being our rest of entering into that rest. So hopefully that gives you a better perspective of why it's so important for us not to forsake the Sabbath, for garden rest to be the picture. And it's available now and it's not yet. It's that now and not yet, but it is available now to be at rest. And that's kind of one of those things we were, I would, the conversation we had yesterday with a couple and being able to really want to embody God's rest in, in what's taking place in our life. And that can happen uh, in the greatest of situations and in difficult ones. And that is our prayer that God, God's garden rest, that paradise, which is another word for garden, is understood in a way that we can experience his rest and his presence now. And so that's, I just thought it was an important part to re recap uh, before we go into the other implications of the detailed portions of it. But does that make sense? What, is, what are your thoughts? So the, the, uh, the word <coughs> garden is, is also paradise? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? <clears throat> yeah. So we, when we talk about paradise, um, 
it, it is very synonymous with garden. So even when Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise, it was also a picture of garden. Wow. Never Your dad's in paradise every day in his garden. <laughs> <laughs> Except for the bugs that eat them, huh? <laughs> the birds. <clears throat> I don't know why, but I thought, you know, when you're talking about the garden, the kingship and everything, I thought the one, you know, one of the wonders of the world is the the gardens of you know the Babylon. Mm -hmm. I go, how could that be a garden, you know, or 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 uh, how it's a wonder? I mean, and I was, mm. uh, I never even looked into the total garden of Babylon, but I can't imagine what Eden looked like or what finally what you know paradise is going to look like. Yeah, that's neat parallel yeah and we cannot forsake sabbath rest yeah. is is the sabbath valid today yeah <laughs> understanding it from that perspective there was no sabbath doesn't apply to me anymore we you, you can hear debates or bible studies about the sabbath was important for then but not so much for now jesus he put away the sabbath it, the language is incorrect it would be that christ is the sabbath Therefore, Sabbath is still important. True rest is only going to be found in him. And that idea of we cannot still forsake Sabbath, because otherwise we're forsaking Christ himself. So like how they said that um, you know, actually every day is Sabbath. You know? So every day is rest with the Lord. I can see that picture, you know. Yeah. Yeah, pretty neat. They would have approached as they entered into the tabernacle. Uh, they approached the, the altar. There's also a approaching of the wash basin. And um, well, we'll go back. I want to go back and talk about the altar a little bit more before we get there. I don't know how far we're going to get today. But Hebrews chapter 13. <clears throat> Nine through sixteen. He's talking about the Hebrew author is talking about just living well, pleasing God. Uh, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings, for it is well for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by regulations about food, uh, which have not defiled. I'm sorry, which have not benefited those who observe them. We have an altar from which those who officiate in the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whom blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the, gate, uh, the city gate in order to sanctify the people by his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp and bear the abuse he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips uh, that confess his name. Do not neglect to do good as to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So what was the key sacrifice in this, in this case? It's the sacrifice of praise from our lips. Offering the sound of praise from our lips that would, it says, through him, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God. This is verse 15. That is the fruit of lips that confess his name. So it's not this, don't confuse this with singing only. We're going to come in and offer a offering of sacrifice of praise this is what my lips utter, they're going to reflect his name. The things that I say, I'm only going to say, I'm only going to do and, and say the things that I, I see and hear the Father show me. Me not using my lips to further gain, further from my gain, but to allow my lips to be an offering uh, up to the Lord and the things that come out of my mouth will be praise, an offering of praise. That is to um, edify, lift up, magnify his name. 
the Hebrew author, all the things he could have said, the, the thing he says is the offering of praise in this way is our lips being under control by God. And we understand our lips don't do anything. They just move. But it's from that core of our heart. And so it's from the holy place that things are going to come from. And I believe uh, there are, I'm not sure if we're going to get into that portion of, I think we will in a minute in Hebrews, but it's talking about our hearts being that central place where we move from. We'll go ahead and we'll turn back a couple chapters, chapter nine of Hebrews. He, ta he's continue, he talks about sacrificing, actually nine first, and then we went a little bit backwards order, but I wanted to read that passage first. 9.11 says, But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and, bull and bulls with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer sacrifices those who have been defiled <clears throat> so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from death, works to worship, uh, conscience from death works to worship the living God. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance because, of, because a death had occurred that redeems them from the transgressions under the first covenant. So we know this. I think we've all heard the idea that Christ is that final sacrifice. We know it, and it, I think it may be a little bit difficult for us to see. There's no wow factor for us, maybe, as it would have been for some of the early church as they had been practicing for thousands of years, this idea of sacrifice, sacrifice. And then here is Christ and being finally made aware that he is that final sacrifice. <clears throat> and if you remember Hebrews, there was already the talk of him being the high priest. And now in chapter nine, he's at, they're moving towards this picture of not only is he the high priest, but he's the one offering himself. The high priest is offering himself as a sacrifice <clears throat> and not just a sacrifice, but the unblemished, perfect Lamb of God, the, the wow factor that would have come into play for those hearing it, and maybe the light bulb going off for the first time, I think would have brought many of them to tears. This idea that there was a final sacrifice made, that they no longer have separation, that garden life, that holy of holies, that access to God's presence was no longer a thing to only hear about from stories of Adam, from, and from Adam and Eve, and from the very beginning. It's no longer this picture that, man, yeah, it would have been great to recognize what garden life looked like, walking and talking with God. But now, through Christ, that sacrifice is made once and for all, where we can enter into that holy place and have access to the throne room of God. Not just having access and it being a physical place in the temple where we can walk in now, but then being told, no, you are the temple. You are the tabernacle. You can't just, it's not about you just being able to have access to walk in and encounter God somewhere. He's in you and you are that thing. So mind's blown and it's the light bulbs going off and the heart burning was a, I believe, a real thing. And it, it is for us when we can truly understand what does that mean? Implications. Because we, we don't get it. I know we don't. I don't get it. Uh, it's that process of moving towards. Because even in the language we hear from the pulpit, from me, from it, it's that language of I'm praying to God and it's like this out thing. I, I hope God hears me or um, God's looking down from above. It's the, all this language we use and don't you mean instead God who is seeing you through my eyes, like the God who is living in me, we tend to speak from God from an outside heavenly thing, and we less, we're less likely to talk about him from God within. And I want that transition to happen in my life more to where I am, when I'm speaking about the holy God of the universe, I'm speaking at it from a perspective of he's inside me because I'm the temple. And we, as a body, are the temple. 
So getting away from talking about God out there somewhere who is watching down on us and the good Lord from above, it's the, it's the God from within. Because we are the temple. We are the tabernacle because of that sacrifice Christ made. Get it? Living that way is a, diff is a difference. We get it here. We grasp it here because that's what God said and it's true. But it's the grasping here in our hearts that's the, that's the difficult part. Yeah. Yep. Because all these things boil up and the biggest one is worth. We're mm -hmm. not worthy to have the God of the universe make his home amongst us, within us. And that's, I think that's a constant battle that all of us fight. Right. I know for me, the brief moments in time that I have experienced that has been the most overwhelming, joyful feeling that I could ever experience. And that life is available at all times. We don't experience it all the time. But, it, but he's there. And he's not there out there. He's here. Yeah. It's a shift of not just thinking, but it's a shift of living. For 2 Corinthians 5, 21 <clears throat> Since we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And then verse 21, for our sake, he made himself to be sin who knew no sin. That alone is a, it's, it's a crazy idea. He made himself sin who knew no sin so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. You said 1 Corinthians 5.21? 2 Corinthians. Oh. 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Not that we might experience the righteousness of God, that we might become the righteousness of God. Again, that's one of these things where intellectually, we, even that we can't understand, but from a, a life standpoint, that does really conflict with our worth if we don't understand our worth in him. Mine uh, interprets uh, from verse 20, it says, God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And I think that's a good uh, representation of that offering of praise. Mm -hmm. Through our lips, we are making appeals to come back to God, for people to see. Yeah. Mm. These are all offerings that we give. This is what I believe our life looks like being, <clears throat> what is it, the question of what does the brazen altar mean in my life? If I'm temple, if I'm tabernacle, it's not about what part of my body is the altar. It's all. And so am I the brazen altar? Am I a constant burning of sacrifice? And, and we, we're going to look at the altar of incense as well. That's the, that's the constant burning of communing with God, fellowship, prayer, that sweet aroma that needs to take place as well. But there's, that's different from me sacrificing and offering in this way, uh, Slightly. I think it's all encompassed in one, in me. But <clears throat> there is a definite need for a shift to happen uh, of recognizing that the altar never ends, that the sacrifices don't cease. I think one thing for me, too, that gives me hope is knowing if, if this makes sense, that 
a lot of this is choice. And I have the choice to incorporate this into my life and to live this way if I'm willing to do the work and do the things that I need to do to have it. Not like works, but do you know what I mean? Because yep. it's, it's not just like, ooh, you have it, you know? And so that gives me hope that um, I'm kind of like, I reach out and ask him, help me do this, and he's going to do it. And I can have those moments of joy, like you said, more often and, and be part of my life. Yeah, great. That's a, that's a great um, word of truth in terms of how we don't obtain the living truth just by asking. We ask, and you, oftentimes the way he works that in us and through us is by allowing some kind of obstacle to present itself so that we are forced to either demonstrate the thing that we are praying towards or we fail <laughs> and we recognize, oh, I still have more room to grow. And I think we've alluded to that picture of Jesus praying for Peter, uh, where Jesus says that Satan has asked and Jesus says, I'm going to pray that your faith doesn't fail. And that's just been on my mind all the last couple of weeks, just that truth of Jesus praying for Peter, Jesus making intercession for us, not to protect me from pain, but to lift me up and, and my faith in him wouldn't fail through it. And when it does, I, I, I'm able to get up and continue to move and encourage those around us. And what is the encouragement around us? It is in seeing failure take place and restoration take place, I believe. It's that it's not just how can you encourage a brother when oftentimes we may feel like now I have now I'm no longer able to encourage brethren because I have failed. Who am I to be able to speak into their life? Look at me, I'm a failure. It was the opposite. It was I have failed. I have been restored, Peter. Now I can be on this rock, Jesus alludes to say, you are going to be one of the large catalysts of growth and change for his body. How could it be? You're, he's one of the largest failures as a disciple because the redemptive work of Christ is going to speak louder than the failure itself. Hmm. I, personally, I'm more able to um, give value to what a person says to me or give value to someone who, who quote unquote counsels me when I understand that they've been through what I'm facing. And the value of their lesson or their, um, how they've gone through it um, gives validity to my feelings and what I'm going through, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. When I know you've gone through it and I can see where you're at now, I want to know how did you get there? Exactly. I want to know. It gives a foundational place to say... <clears throat> How, how, are you in, how in the world are you able to be where you're at? And <clears throat> truth, is, I think, is going to be not that someone who hasn't gone through it can speak truth, but when you can see someone come through it, you know they've lived truth. And I, from the core of who we are, we want to experience it. We don't just want to understand it. Even if we resign ourselves to a knowledge, information-based knowledge, deep down we want an intimately-based knowledge. And we can, we can recognize it. Our hearts can see genuineness and truth. And so, absolutely, when we see someone who has failed and come back from that um, in a different manner where there's strength and power and joy, yeah, give me that. And so I think that is going to speak louder. But if we are going to be a Pharisee, we're not going to see. We're going to see how you failed and how you can no longer, you have no right to speak into my life. And we have a different perspective. And I believe Jesus is saying, you're missing the boat. <laughs> Peter, yeah, you're going to fail. I pray that your faith doesn't fail you. It's going to. <laughs> but when you have come back, encourage the brethren. And I'm going to give you the resources and the ability and, and, the, and the worth to be able to do it. Yeah. Hmm. yeah I think of the just scripture alone. It, it, you, know, you would think that God would had ordained a, a book with all these, you know, great things that were done, but it just <laughs> talked about all these failures, you know, 
Paul or David or Eric, all of them. And uh, like Mary was saying, you know, the, you know, we hear their failures and they talk it and they speak it and they speak this power and joy. Through. Yep. Yeah, it's, it is. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, isn't the Bible more of about, a, when you look at the people in there, it's more of a book of failures <laughs> yeah. and restoration mm -hmm. than it is about good Christians and good Israelites who never wandered. So you have David, a lying, murderous adulterer <laughs> who, I mean, I don't know what else he can, he, horrible things. And then when we reflect upon him, it's, yeah, David, the man after my own heart. Like, what? In what book are you reading? Did you see the things he did? When we look at Samson. We look at Abraham, his lack of faith. It's like he's going to go out and have his maidservant. You're going to get her pregnant and, then, and call that faith. And it's like, yeah, look at the father of our faith. And we're like, what? What book are you reading? We would, just like you're saying, Dad, we would expect, like, there's, there must be a different Bible that <laughs> you're reading. Because what I see is a whole lot of failures. But these men who failed, the reason why they are lifted up is because they didn't forsake Sabbath. They didn't forsake the promised hope, the future hope. They didn't forsake their faith. Genuine faith doesn't mean you're not going to fail. Peter, I believe, had genuine faith and was learning to understand what does that look like. The, the little faith he had, yeah, it failed him. He failed it. He, whatever the wording you want to use. But when you look at Peter, there's this rock. Because though he stuck his foot in his mouth more times than he spoke truth, probably, <laughs> his, his heart was to move towards that rest. When asked, are you going to leave me too? He chimes up and says, where are we going to go? You alone have the words of eternal life. And Jesus is saying, ah, that's it. I know you're going to fail, but that truth right there is that's what you need to hold on to. You're going to fail. The people around you are going to fail. There's going to be pain. There's going to be messiness. But if you hold on to the truth that is God, your faith, though it may wane and fail at times, you're going to come back. And that coming back is the key to say, I have genuine faith. If your faith fails you to the point where you walk away, then you're like the seed who withers in the, in the trying times and it probably wasn't genuine faith. So there's that picture where we continue to endure, 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 press on towards the rest. And so just, you guys, yeah, you guys are hitting it on the head in terms of what does that look like? And, uh, that is entering into his rest. Speed bumps and bruises and all. <laughs> and it's a, there's a beauty and a joy in knowing that we can turn back. That the forgiveness is always there. Mm. Yep, you're hitting on chapter six of Hebrews already. <laughs> it's a good little preview. What does that mean that... Uh, once we fall away, we can't come back. Or what does that mean? We'll get there for those who are, are in a Wednesday group. Can we move on to the water, Jesus, the water basin? And we probably will. That's the only other instrument we'll get to today. <laughs> I was uh, preparing last night. I didn't have a whole lot of time just because of what we were, what we were going through this week and just praying towards. But last night I told Christine, I don't know what we're going to talk about because I didn't have a whole lot in, but Christine said, uh, you always have plenty to talk about. <laughs> I agree. And I, I was trying to prepare multiple aspects of what we were going to go in the holy place and the showbread and the table and how is that us, but I'm, we're not even going to get there <laughs> this week. So unfortunately, I don't think uh, Holy of Holies and Ark is not going to be for another six weeks probably. So hold on to your, hold on to your pants. <laughs> <clears throat> Chapter 7 of Mark, you need to read that whole chapter. We're not going to read the whole thing today. But it talks about the Pharisees coming against Jesus for the disciples, not washing their hands before eating, the ceremonial cleansing before. And so they are accusing the disciples of defiling themselves because the food that is coming in is being taken in by unclean, uh, by defiled hands. And they, have not be, they are unwashed is the word that is used. Verse 3 says, for the Pharisees... And all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus obtaining serving, um, thus they, uh, let's see, sorry, observing the traditions of the elders, and they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And they are also 
uh, many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups and pots and bronze kettles. Interesting, they're talking about all the different items in the temple. Uh, those are all the things that we mentioned that were on the table of showbread. Verse 5 says, So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the traditions of the elders? That should have been key. Why do, that, do they not live according to the traditions? Because we were never, ever called to live according to traditions. Traditions aren't bad if they, are, if they live in the foundation of truth and the bigger picture. But they were stuck on the big picture and they missed, I mean, they stuck on the tradition and they missed the big picture. He says, why do they forsake those? But they eat with defiled hands. He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, <laughs> as it is written. This people honor me with their lips, but with their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. Wow, that's the same world we live in today. Unfortunately, we are stuck on biblical precepts and we are calling it truth living, but we are forsaking. We are honoring God with our lips. I think that that is unfortunately so prevalent within the church today that the church, even as elders, as leaders, as pastors, there is a lot of lip service taking place where the truth of God is coming through they are, they are passing through the lips. And this talks about what we were talking about before, offering that offering of praise. Well, here he is clarifying what does that mean. Isaiah, as he prophesied, these people honor me with their lips, which is good. I, I, we want lips praising, but their hearts are far from me. The only true offering of praise is if it's coming from that place of our heart, of the inner being. If the inner place is not the place where this, is birthing the words coming out of my mouth, then it's lip service at best. And in, in, in many ways, it's going to become an abomination. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. I feel that's where I, I was raised in the church, where it was about these precepts. And that's actually even the language that the, the denomination or non-denomination that we were raised in, they use that language. It's precept upon precept. And it's like, yeah, that's what we need to do as a church. So in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with precepts or truths. But if the heart and the intimacy is not there, we're missing it. And these Pharisees missed it. So as we look and we read through scriptures, the charge to you and me, even today, is to recognize we are probably more on the side in the camp of the Pharisee than we are of the disciples. And we need to hear this, that we have, I believe, just culturally, when we recognize where we're at, we are probably more on the side of the Pharisee in how we operate in our faith than we do as the disciple of Christ, who missed it, or as, as Christ, obviously as Christ. But we are more in this place, and maybe I just need to speak for myself, in when I look at truth, I look at it, at it from a precept informational way, and I'm trying to take it within the holy place of who I am. I'm trying to allow God who within me is making sense of these truths, but oftentimes I respond from the information based of this is what your word says, so this is what I'm going to do, and my heart isn't necessarily understanding or there, or there's a disconnect. He says you have, verse 8, you have abandoned the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. It's tradition, tradition, tra We don't think we live under tra tradition, but there are so many that we can't even see. That much of the practice that we do, even within a service on Sunday morning, uh, which aren't bad if rooted in truth, but when observed from a traditional point only, we're going to miss, we can miss the heart of God. Verse 10 says, for Moses said, honor your father and mother, and whoever speaks evil of father and mother must surely die. But you say that if anyone tells father and mother whatever support you might have from me in the city, uh, that is an offering to God. Then you have no longer permitted doing anything for a father or mother, thus making void the word of God through your tradition that you have handed on. 
and you do not, uh, and you do many things like this. Uh, you can go back and study what is that meaning. We're, we won't get into that necessarily this morning. He's again just showing the way that you're trying to live up to the word, but not to the heart of, of the truth. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside a person that by doing it, by doing in, can defile. But the things that come out are what defile. It's not about the outward that defiles. It is the heart that is ultimately the instrument of being defiled if we're not focusing on that portion of us. He tells the whole crowd listening, listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing, this is verse 15, there is nothing outside a person that by doing in, uh, by going in, sorry, going in, that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. So they're talking about the food. You're touching it with your defiled hands, this tradition. It's like, why are you stuck on this thing? It's not about what you're taking in. It's about what's coming out. That's, that's the true defilement. When he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. He said to them, um, then do you also fail the understanding do you not see that whatever goes in a person from outside cannot defile, since it enters not the heart but the stomach, and goes in uh, and goes out into the sewer? <laughs> That's kind of a interesting language. <laughs> <clears throat> Thus he declares all food clean, and he said, "It is what comes out of a person that defiles, for it is from within." from the human heart that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit. He goes through a list of things. All those things are rooted in the heart. So what needs to change? Not our ceremonial traditions and actions. The heart needs to change. I think we were talking about this a little on Wednesday about the things I do, it seems like, man, they're such stumbling blocks, but the things I do, the outward isn't really much. It's it, it, the inward that needs to be the focal point. If we focus on the inward and intimacy with Christ, we're going to recognize that the things coming out are actually more honoring to God. It's not about us learning to stop sinning and how can I do, how can I not do this thing? Our heart is being able to have the freedom through grace under the umbrella of his sacrifice to say thank you that I don't have to figure out how I need to stop doing this behavior. Thank you that I can focus on the heart of God, your heart, on my heart. And then from there, I'm going to notice that the things coming out of me are going to be less sinful things. It's going to be less rest living. It's going to be less, less peace um, striving and more just a natural outflowing because my heart is God's heart. And this, this idea of needing to learn to stop doing certain behaviors can only come by focusing on how does the heart change. Now, I, do, I just want to clarify a little bit on that. That doesn't mean we put into practice the submission work that we've talked about. Uh, submitting our bodies to things, offering as a sacrifice. These are the ways that we put our heart under control of God. By fasting, by tithing, by um, solitude, Doing these things and exercises is me, Paul, beating my body into submission to be able to run the race. So it is not just a me resigning that, thank God, he did all the offerings so I can sit back and just relax. Well, you're not going to see sin stopping then. Because that sin offering was the freedom to now me move with Christ and work towards the picture of sanctification. So there is still a me aspect in there, but it is not me learning how to stop sinning. It is me how to live in the garden with him. It is me being given the freedom to not focus, have to focus on my sin and to be able to focus on Jesus. And from that place, all these other things start to change and continue to change. It's just a change in dynamics of how we operate. Do you see that picture? That's freedom. That's, that's true freedom and joy. When I can say, I can, I don't want to say I can, I can care less about what I'm doing, but I'm going to care far more about what's happening in my heart and that change. And, and hope people are gonna show me the same grace that I wanna show them when we do fail 
and while we're in process of this thing. So the washing isn't necessary in terms of my fingers, my hands, my feet being washed. The water basin that we washed our hands and feet in were not so that um, as a demonstration to prove that I'm holy. It is a demonstration that I need to be made holy. I need a washing. The washing didn't make me pure. The need for me to wash was a reminder that I'm not pure. Does that make sense? Hopefully that, is that communicated clear? So they were thinking by them washing the hands, all of a sudden they are righteous. It was the opposite. The need, the, the fact that I need to wash my hands demonstrates that I'm not yet righteous <laughs> and that I need to continue to do this. So the other, John 13, read that on your own, Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. It's a great picture where Peter's like, no, 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 don't wash my feet. I need to, and Jesus said, if you don't let me do this, you have no part of me. I need to wash your feet. My water, me, living water, needs to cleanse you. And then he's saying, well, didn't wash all of me. And he's saying, no, Peter, it's not about you being cleansed. Uh, you, you already have been cleansed or will be through his sacrifice, but there's still a need for constant washing by the Spirit in our life. Yes, I have received the full washing of my spirit, of my heart, yet I am not yet washed. It, 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 you see one of those, again, yes, now, but not yet. Yes, you've been washed clean. You are mine. You, I only see you as pure and righteous. Yet, until you are that picture, there's, a, there's, a still, there's still a washing that needs to be done. For you to recognize that it's not of you, you've been washed, and we can't no longer never be washed because it's like, oh, no, I don't, I'm pure now. I'm righteous. I'm God. No, you're only that because of what Christ has done. And as a reminder, you still need, you still need this washing. So we still come to Christ and say, please wash over me or cleanse me of my unrighteousness, not because he hasn't fully done that, but because we need to, in our humanity, recognize I still need that. I still need that in this sanctification process. So the washing is much more about me recognizing I am defiled in who I am and only the righteousness of Christ because of what he's done. And we can never lose fact uh, of that truth in our hearts. Make sense? Perfectly. Good. Good. I think you need to do a whole study just on that, Danny. <laughs> That's <laughs> good. Isn't that good? Yeah. Yeah. I think we'll end there for the day because that's that's enough truth to chew on. <clears throat> mm. Yeah, recognizing I am defiled does not mean that I don't have worth, though. I have divine worth through the blood of Christ and the fact that he lives within me. His spirit is inside. I am temple. So, Balance those two. Recognize we can find the truest joy when we recognize that righteousness isn't from me, but it's within me and living from that place. There's joy, there's power, there is entitlement even. That's a, a weird word to use, but because of God, we have been given the kingdom. <laughs> so that is, I mean, there's things to be puffed up and proud about in Christ as we continually recognize we need to be washed. We need, we need this cleansing. So let's move from that place today as we move forward until next week. I can see how um, you and Christine prayed and set yourself in thinking to be reverence to these other people that you spoke to, knowing what, you know, where we all come from, you know, from that sinful nature, but that grace is there. So you're, you're giving grace and when you're able to speak into them, knowing that you're still being sanctified, you're being used in your mind and heart, or your heart, knowing you could be used in that process. And I could see that kind of more. Mm. In the picture. Yeah, and it was, it was even, it was, it was not even so much what we could communicate, but yeah. in, in being able to enabled to allow our spirit and their spirit to communicate and be as one. <clears throat> I don't, we don't want to go into conversations 
and we did intend this one of what are we going to be able to teach? It was actually much more, what are we, what are we going to be able to learn? Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> that was, I think, I, I genuinely think that was our heart and in multiple conversations we have. I think that's where I want to be all the time. Not so much what can I, how are you guys going to use me as an instrument of teaching? I don't feel that was even the case yesterday. It was more of just how can we be a vessel of honor? <laughs> Whether there's learning, conversation, whatever that looks like. Uh, and allow God to be glorified in us and in them. And in it's just, that's how God, I think that's the business of what God does in being able to allow two people to be emptied or four people or whatever the thing is. And uh, to walk away knowing God has been honored uh, through the me being temple, you being temple. And as we encounter the things in marriage uh, with our kids, I mean, there's, the struggles we have for those of you who have kids still, parents, I know you have kids. <laughs> the idea of what does it look like to submit and allow God to teach me through them instead of even what can I teach them. And that's not a perspective I think I take often, but when I do, uh, I think he shows up more often. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Because me learning to speak to someone's heart involves me learning to hear their heart. And there's a learning process that needs to take place, even when it comes to our kids, but in, in all conversations. And that's a whole other thing of us being able to stop a moment and listen, not just to the heart of God, but to others, right? Because in reality, isn't the heart of someone else who is temple the heart of God? <laughs> so if I need to hear God's heart, then I need to stop and be able to listen as well. And those are hard things. It can be, but it's beautiful. And it's why God puts other people in your life. Yep. 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 And if you treat that interaction with the worth of speaking to someone who has God, um, it's, it, it's an incredible exchange and God honoring. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys. Thank you. Any final words before we adjourn? <laughs> so you will uh, send out a text or something um, if you're not going up in the balloon on Saturday? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I'll let you guys know. Send out pictures if you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, smoke filled pictures. Yep. Yeah. All righty. Well, have okay. a good rest of the weekend. Love you, beautiful. everybody. Love you. Bye, y'all. We'll talk soon. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.